G'day. Pretty much ever since the dawn of civilization, we humans have been using tools and technology to make our lives easier and more enjoyable. And over the centuries, we've found increasingly more sophisticated ways to do it. For instance, in the field of entertainment, you're probably familiar with the process of chroma key, where you place your presenter into a special TV studio like this one I'm standing in now. Now, the background in here is a special blue, but sometimes they do use green. And because blue is very different to the color of my skin and my clothes, the clever people in video post-production can use computer software to replace the brightly colored studio behind me with some other background which has the effect of appearing to transport me into a completely different environment. Ah. Speaking of transport, one of the success stories of the 20th century is aviation, and it's radically transformed the way we live. Did you know that each year there are 3 billion passenger journeys by plane? Which, given there's only 6 billion of us on the planet, shows that it's a pretty popular way of getting around. Now these days, we think nothing of hopping onto an aircraft and just a few hours later getting off thousands of kilometres away. But a century ago, it was a very different story. And a lot of brave men and women risked their lives to prove that flying long distances was possible. Aircraft back then were pretty rough and ready, made from wood and wire and cloth, like this Avro baby here in the Queensland Museum. This plane actually belonged to Bert Hinkler. And in 1921, he set a long-distance record in that very plane by flying non-stop from Sydney to Bundaberg in 8 hours and 40 minutes. But here in the Hingler Hall of Aviation, we've built a replica so you can actually climb aboard and imagine what it must have been like to sit in that cramped cockpit with the engine roaring, the smell of oil and the cold wind blowing in your face for hours at a time, all the while concentrating hard to fly in a straight line. Now, if you've been paying attention during your visit here, you'll already know that he was a talented pilot. But what many people don't realise is that Bert was also a very gifted engineer and inventor. He had to be in many ways. To keep those early aircraft flying, you had to be part mechanic and part magician. Now, sadly, it's often the case that when new technologies are first adopted in a big way, it's by the military for use in warfare. And so the first major conflict that saw heavy use of airplanes was World War I. And when young Bert Hinkler left Australia to further his career in aviation, the best way to get into flying was to join the Royal Naval Air Service over in England. He didn't land a job straight away as a pilot, but the next best thing was getting airborne as a gunner slash observer. That's the guy up in the front of the plane armed with a machine gun. Those early machine guns were pretty primitive and often jammed. Bert soon got tired of wrecking his thumbs trying to clear the rotten thing and being an inventive sort of chap, came up with a little tool that did the job for him. Before long, he was being pestered by his mates to make more and it wasn't long before the top brass got wind of it and they became standard issue. This was the first of several inventions Bert came up with to improve the lot of the guy in the front seat. Now, one problem for gunners was the hot shell casing ejected after each bullet was fired. Now, this was OK while you were flying along in a straight line because they'd go over the side. But when the pilot threw a quick evasive manoeuvre, the shells fell back into the lap of the gunner. Now, understandably, Bert soon got tired of hot metal falling all over him. And he came up with a nifty solution, so the offending items were safely ejected away from the crew. This was also popular with the lads. On many of these early warplanes, the machine gun was mounted facing forward. Now, clearly this presents a serious problem, as a pail of lead is the natural enemy of a wooden propeller. And the potential for disaster is extremely high. It was the German engineer, Anthony Fokker, who came up with interrupting gear that mechanically linked the engine crankshaft to the firing mechanism of the gun, so stopping it from firing while there was a propeller blade in front of the muzzle. Great idea. The first British attempts at this resulted in quite a slow rate of fire. 
but Hinkler came up with a system which made it possible to fire up to 500 rounds each minute. A prototype was successfully tested in air combat, but it's not clear if the idea was ever widely adopted by the Air Corps. Eventually, Bert became a pilot, and in 1917, he registered patent number 2215 for an idea inspired by his missions over France. Many of the two-seater aircraft at the time employed a dual-control system, so if the pilot was shot, the observer at least had a chance of landing the plane and surviving. Now, given that the average life expectancy of pilots in World War I was only a few weeks, this was very likely to happen. And if it did, there was also a very good chance the injured pilot would collapse on the controls, making it tough for the guy in the front seat to fly the plane. Bert came up with a clever system that allowed either of the crew to reach a lever that would determine which of the systems was working. Move the lever over to one side and only the rear controls would work. Move it over to the other side and only the front controls would be active. And place the lever in the middle position and both sets of controls could be operated. Very neat. Of course, eventually the so-called war to end all wars came to an end. And after he was demobilised, Bert Hinkler went on to become one of Britain's top civil aviation test pilots and a world record-breaking airman. But you can't stop a man with engineering in his veins from tinkering. And he continued to lodge patents for numerous improvements to aircraft design. One of these inventions relates to aircraft with folding wings. Planes take up a lot of space on the ground. And one way to cram more of them into a small space is to fold the wings, either back or up. And you can still see this today on modern aircraft carriers. But back in Bird's day, they used to pull the wings back and then secure them to the body of the plane with a rod. These rods were a pain to work with, and they often got lost or left behind. So, Bert worked out a way to lock the wings back in place using the struts of the wing itself. Now, another issue with folding wings is that as they move backwards, the plane's centre of gravity shifts, and this puts extra weight onto the rear and upsets the general balance. With patent 294319, Bert provided a neat way to make sure that the front wheels moved slightly backwards as the wings were moved. Some of the undercarriage struts were attached to the main body of the plane, while others were fixed to the folding part of the wings. And as these change position, the undercarriage pivots so the wheels end up slightly further back. And you can see this modification fitted to Bert's Avro Avian. Bert Hinkler was a truly gifted engineer, both academically and practically. On one hand, he was able to deal with the complex mathematics of aircraft design, but he also had the hands-on skill to manufacture detailed parts and link them together into complicated assemblies. But one of his simplest inventions is possibly one of his best. He called it the Hinkler Aerial Navigation Board. And it was the predecessor of these modern flight calculating devices, like this one. When you're flying a plane, it's very important to take into account the direction and speed of the prevailing wind, because as you follow the course towards your destination, it's highly likely that the wind will ever so slowly be pushing you off centre. And if you get it wrong enough, you could end up a long way from the nearest place to land and without enough fuel to get you to safety. And then you crash, which is bad. So the trick is to alter your direction to compensate for the effect of wind drift. Here's an example Bert gave in a letter to his mother. To get from Bundaberg to Brisbane, you head almost due south on a course of 170 degrees. However, if the wind is coming in from the west at 20 miles per hour, you'll have to steer at 183 degrees in order to travel in a straight line from Bundy to Brisbane. And also, if you check your instruments and find the airspeed of the plane is 80 miles per hour, that's not going to be your actual travel speed because the wind is slightly assisting you. Now, if you do the sums, you'll find out that your speed over ground is actually going to be 85 miles per hour, which means that your 200 mile journey is going to take roughly two hours and 25 minutes. However, if the wind was coming from the east at 20 miles per hour, 
you'd have to adopt a course of 156 degrees, and that would be slightly into the wind, so your ground speed would drop to 75 miles per hour, and the journey would take 15 minutes longer. Obviously, you'll want to make sure that you have enough fuel for the extended flying time, so these calculations are very important. Of course, these days, the planes fly a lot faster. So the effect of wind direction is nowhere near as great. And also, we have handy computer tools to do all the work for you. But back then, you drew lots of lines and angles all over a piece of paper before you set off. The thing is, though, wind direction can change during your journey. And an open cockpit is not the best place to be scribbling notes. Which is why Bert came up with his nifty combination of three arms and two protractors that allowed him to make calculations literally on the fly. Bert's other inventions include a wide-angle topography camera for taking aerial photography and a system for making night landings. But tragically, at the age of 40, he was killed making another solo record attempt. Otherwise, who knows what amazing ideas he might have come up with had he made it to a ripe old age. His last and biggest invention was the IBIS, an amphibious plane that he hoped would revolutionise the light aircraft industry. But that's another story. And as you continue your trip around our museum, you'll find a replica of the IBIS plus an explanation of its design and capabilities. Thanks for coming. <laughs>